success. Good luck, eh? Hi, everybody. Welcome to All Things Aviation and Aerospace. I'm Vince Mickens with the Private Air Media Group. As most of you know, we uh, every week I have guests on from a variety of disciplines in the fields of aviation and aerospace. And you know, I've seen a number of women over the years in the industry knocking down barriers, breaking through obstacles, and accomplishing some amazing things. But throughout the series of shows that I've been doing during Women's History Month and in, in acknowledgement of International Women's Day uh, during the month of March, I was kind of blown away. I, I was like, wow, um, some serious accomplishments in a variety of areas that I didn't even know uh, women were doing things in, in this industry uh, outside of the obvious. So I, I, I think it's been great. It's a bit, uh, observing the diversity of accomplishments and, and actually being able to be a part of that. So much so that I said, okay, I know Women's History Month ended yesterday, but I'm going to sneak one more show in <laughs> that kind of focuses on uh, women and the accomplishments, uh, particularly in, in aviation and aerospace. And that brings me to our two guests today, who I'm just honored to have both. Uh, both have, have had and are having amazing careers, and I think are going to be able to shed a lot of light on uh, a lot of things from their uh, what they do and, and how they got there to just their determination and persistence to to pursue their path uh, of, and their goals and that type of thing. So without further ado, I'll start out by introducing Dr. Yolanda Shea. Uh, Dr. Shea is a physical research scientist and she studies and explores things like atmospheric science. She's also a project scientist for the NASA Clario Pathfinder, which is orbiting our Earth and looking at things uh, that are related to climate. I think it's really great because a lot of the conversation, particularly in recent years, has been about climate change and, and how that's affecting. And, and Dr. Shea is on the forefront of that with regard to um, the scientific side of it and things like that. So it'll be interesting to see how she got into it and, and also what she does. And then all the way from Johannesburg, South Africa, beaming in via <laughs> Zoom webinar, <laughs> we have uh, uh, what, what she describes herself as a social entrepreneur, which I think is very cool. And she's an advocate of girls' education in STEAM. Uh, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. Rafilwe Ledwaba. Did I say that right, Rafilwe? Without oh, yeah, rolling my R? <laughs> you did. <laughs> Ledwaba. Uh, Rafilwe Ledwaba, um, besides being the first African woman helicopter pilot flying for the South African police, Rafilwe uh, founded Girls Fly Program, uh, in, uh, a Girls Fly Program in Africa Foundation and is the general manager of Drone Safety and Legal, which is a drones training tech startup. Rafil Way, welcome all the way from Johannesburg. Thank you for having me. It's, it's great to have you. And, and I'm, I guess I can call you Yolanda. I want to call you Dr. Shea just to give you your props, but welcome to the show as well. Please do call me Yolanda. <laughs> okay, will do. Now that I have your permission, I will do that. So really great to have, uh, have both of you on with us uh, today uh, to talk about your careers and, and to hear your advice to our young viewers and their parents that may be watching uh, with regard to uh, this, this show. So we were having a really fun discussion prior to coming live on the air. So might as well continue that conversation. And, and I'm going to start it with you, Rafael Way. You have had quite a journey there in South Africa from, 
from early on. So why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about how you got started and how, how aviation came into the picture? Oh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Vince, for the, in, uh, the invitation. And uh, Dr. Tashia, it's, it's an honor to be sharing this platform with you. Yeah, I've got quite a very ex interesting but exciting story. Um, as we were discussing earlier, I was born in the northern part of uh, South Africa. It's a town in a township called uh, Lenyenye. It, 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 it was quite an interesting childhood because from early on, I was exposed to very powerful women. So there was no point in my life I thought I wouldn't do anything. So I grew up thinking I could be absolutely anything. And I wanted to become a doctor. However, I was also born in, um, in the apartheid era. Even though I knew that I could become anything, there was still limitation within that anything. Because as in South Africa at that point, as black people, there were certain things that we could do and certain things that we couldn't do. So I wanted to become a doctor and that's the path that I followed. I was accepted at university uh, to study for a science degree, microbiology and biochemistry in order to pursue my career of becoming a doctor. And it was during um, the four years of study that I took my first flight. And it was in that first flight that um, there was a female pilot and I thought female could fly because earlier on, um, when I was growing up in Limpopo, I've never seen anybody that looks like me. I've never seen women fly. And I, I was telling Vince earlier that the closest pilot that I've seen was Tom Cruise on TV and he doesn't look anything like me. So, you know, obviously it, it, it was never a viable career choice for me. So it was in second year that it actually became a viable career choice because I saw another woman flying. But as a black woman, I still thought, no, maybe it's, you know, not really. You know, even though it's, I started thinking about it, but not really. And it was only when I finished varsity that I joined an airline as cabin crew. And the reason why I joined an airline as cabin crew is I actually wanted to pay back my study loans so I can save money and proceed and go and do, you know, go on to do medical school. So you and were basically was, a flight attendant for a while. Yes, I was. I just, spent just about to learn more three about years. the industry. To learn, it was more to learn more about the industry, but the second thing as well, it was to make money so I can pay back, uh, you know, my student loan to continue to medical school. But it was in that first week of training that I knew that medical school will not take place. I'm going to fly. I'm going to stay on and I'm going to train to become a pilot. I'm going to fly. And there were a whole lot of factors that played a role. I enjoyed the job. I enjoyed the content. But it was so interesting that, you know, the pilots at that uh, particular company kept on saying to me, you're so smart. You should be in front. You should be flying this aircraft. So, you know, sometimes we attribute our successes to only us as individuals. But I had a lot of people along, along the way who pushed me and who made me realize some of the potential that I, I possibly couldn't, you know, couldn't realize myself. So that was quite exciting. So I started taking uh, private lessons and one of the, my instructor was actually one of the captains at that airline. But unfortunately I could afford only one hour a month because I needed to pay back my student loans and with that salary, I could afford one hour. So I was, I was actually, you know, earlier on we we're talking about it that one of the interesting part, it took me about four to five hours to get to the nearest airport because I had to take um, four taxis and, and, uh, to be able to get to an airport. And it's normal. It's not the normal taxis that uh, you know, you're used to in New York where you hail a cab, you get in and it goes. No, it's a Texas where there's normally 15 people. So you get in, you wait for everyone else. So up until there's 15 people, that taxi doesn't move. Wow. So I would spend, yeah, I would spend like an hour, two hours in the first taxi, wait for it to be full, get off the second taxi, wait for it to be full, and the fourth taxi, get to an airport and still walk a little bit of a distance before I can get to the actual flying school. By the time I get there, I'm tired. So you I was flying one hour. Any, you weren't going <laughs> to let anything stop you, huh? No, not at all. And, and I, kept, I kept on doing that every month for that one hour, took the four taxis to the airport so I can, you know, continue with my, you know, with the flight lessons. So yeah, <laughs> that was- How many months was did you- how many months did you do that? Oh no, uh, more years. Not even, years. Not even months. <laughs> wow. So, that's perseverance. Yeah. yeah. Serious so that perseverance. Process, yeah. That process started in, in the early 2000 and I only, I think, got my first break in 2004. So a couple of years I kept on doing that. And I think, I, and I, I think it's, it's quite interesting as well because at some point I realized that 
I am not going to be able to complete my commercial pilot license, or it's going to take me 10 plus years. Because every time I go for a lesson, because I've only flown like for about an hour, uh, the previous one, it's almost like you're starting from the beginning to sort of refresh your lesson and then go on to the next lesson. And then at some point, I wrote 200 letters to every company that I could think of. I told them who I am. This is what I'm doing. This is what I want to do. I want to fly. But most importantly, when I finish my license, I'll make sure that I help other youngsters that are facing similar challenges to, you know, to get to where, you know, so they you were, need to be. You were thinking about that even when you were going through it, about yes. what you could do for the future. You hadn't even gotten where you wanted to be yet, but you were yeah. already thinking about the future. Yes. So, and I was, I mean, I still have that letter. I articulate exactly this is what I'm going to do. Because initially, my, my initial challenge was I didn't know I could become a pilot. So that on its own, it's a challenge. The second one, I didn't have the finances. Two major challenges that are still even today facing, you know, the youth. So from that point, in that letter, I outlined exactly what I was going to do and the impact that I wanted to, you know, that I wanted to have. And three companies responded and all of them the reason one of the reasons why they responded was what because i said what i wanted to do in the future but most importantly as well i already had a science degree which is a basic fund you know the basic foundation of the math and the science already i met the, the you know that criteria of being able to um you know to for my chances of success to actually increase so three of them responded and they invited me to um you know, to go through their selection process. But this was the interesting part. I had- The whole thing is have... interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Your entire story. What do you mean this is the interesting part? So no, go ahead. <laughs> it, it, it is interesting because I've never seen myself a, as a helicopter pilot and not because I didn't want to become a helicopter pilot. I never thought it was an option as well. And I never knew about the careers that I, you know, involved in that particular sector within the helicopters. So when all of three responded, they all said, oh, we like your story, but we want to train you as a helicopter pilot. And I remember the first company, I'm like, mm -mm, I want to become an airline pilot. The second company as well, airline. And the third company, I'm like, no, no, there's something in here. I'm going to take this opportunity because I don't think there'll be any more opportunities coming through. So initially, I took that opportunity. I thought I will be trained as a helicopter pilot. I'll work one or two, uh, you know, two years, then transition because it was going to be cheaper for me to transition to a fixed wing pilot and then join an airline. And that did not happen. I spent 10 years flying helicopters, the best job that I've ever done. The moment I got into that helicopter, I was hooked. And I knew that that is what I wanted to do. I loved the job. I loved flying the helicopters. What was special about flying the helicopter, not only for you in terms of flying it as, a, as an aircraft, but flying it for the South African police? I think it was more the work that we did. It was meaningful work. So you come back home every day, you know you've made a difference. You've either saved a life or you've removed, you know, one of the, you know, you've, somebody was arrested, one of the criminals was removed, but there was always something when you came back. So it wasn't just going up there and coming down. You went out and you did the job. And I think for me, it was, that for me was quite important. And it, it has all been, you know, it has always been important um, in my entire life because the community that I was born at, the women that I was exposed to, they were doing something in their community. So when I was growing up, that was normal for me to be doing work that had an impact in the community. So the job as a helicopter pilot and the work that we did really combined my two passions, the passion of doing something within the community and, you know, and really flying. So, so I think- you, that, you know, that, I'm yeah. sorry, but you bring up a really, really great point because you're, you're, you're sharing something that a lot of us don't know that you grew up in a community where women were progressive and were doing things and were, were trying to do positive things for the community. And we don't always hear that story. We, yeah. we, we, we hear, well, we hear a lot of other things. So yeah. I, I just wanted to, you know, because uh, you have a story that we're going to enjoy throughout the show. But I, I wanted to stop down for just a second and ask you, as you were going through this, as you were studying and riding in taxis and then going in the training program and then flying helicopter, et cetera, and so forth, you, you had been facing a lot of obstacles. What, how did you handle that? you know, mentally, but how did you keep yourself motivated? 
was part of it from the way you were the community you were brought up in or how did you how did you keep moving forward you know vince it was quite interesting that when i was going through that i didn't really think there were obstacles i thought this is part of you know, what we do and what we go through. Because again, I think you mentioned something very important, the upbringing. I was brought up by a single mother. She raised seven kids. And in that particular community, there were the women were teachers leading. They were solving issues every day. We had a woman doctor that had, that had a, a garden. You know, so everyone in that community made a plan in a way. So you grow up as if, okay, if something comes up, you make a plan. Um, and I mean, you if just I go deal back- with it. You deal with it, you make a plan. And if, I mean, if I go back to, to even before I went to university, I didn't even have money to go to university. I had 200 rand and it didn't worry me. 200 rand, I was on my way to Cape Town and I started university and I had to deal with it for four years where, you know, and I finished my degree. And at no point did I, I mean, I did everything at university. I, at no point was I stressed that there's this big problem that I couldn't pay, you know, my fees. Every year I would go, I would pay whatever I have. And if I didn't have enough, I'll go to the university. I'm like, I passed, you can't kick me out of the streets. I'm gonna continue playing, you know, uh, you know, being here. I played sports. I was a captain of the football team. So those things as, as well helped because- Football as in soccer, right? Yes, so, <laughs> soccer, yeah, yeah. Just wanna make that clear for people that <laughs> what the difference is over there. A lot of people don't realize that, that, yeah. that you know, you call that football over there, so. In fact, so everywhere helped, but in yeah. the U.S. <laughs> yeah, no, no, it, it is. Yeah, it is. It is soccer. And, and I think those things helped because now the university knew you're doing all these things. You're participating in everything. So they didn't chase me out because I didn't I couldn't you know, pay my fees. They left me for four years to finish, you know, to actually finish my degree. But just to answer your question, my upbringing was such that at that point it wasn't it was OK, there's a problem. We solve it and we move on. Yes, I don't have money to go to flying, you know, the uh, flying school. I'm going to write 200 letters. Somebody else, you know, out there has money to do it, you know, to, to, to pay for it, to help me pay for it. And that's exactly what I did, you know. So, yes, my upbringing had a huge impact in how I dealt with every perceived challenge that I had, you know, yeah, that I had encountered. Yeah. So, so we're going to save some of your story for a little bit later in the show part two after the helicopter flying for the police you got a whole nother segment to go with that <laughs> but i want to give uh, dr shea an opportunity or yolanda she's asked me to call her an opportunity to tell us a little bit about her path and 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 uh, yolanda yours is also just as interesting because as a kid you were you were actually well i'll let you tell the story but you were actually interested in in weather and meteorology and things like that um at a very early age and and then that transformed into where you are now so so tell us how you got started what what was the what was the igniting factor for you getting into to what you do now in yeah, terms of sure. client assignments um, climate so thank you. science <laughs> <laughs> thank you for um vince for the invitation i feel like i'm so excited to hear more of your story because i'm riveted here um it's a pleasure to be here with you so, um, so I grew up here in the U.S. <laughs> um, and um, I was I was born up in Massachusetts. I lived there until I was about nine years old, and then we moved down to Central Virginia. Um, so it's further south than Massachusetts. Um, I thought the thunderstorms in Virginia were a little bigger and scarier than the ones I remembered in Massachusetts, and this made me nervous for some reason. I was afraid of tornadoes. There, tornadoes are not that common in Virginia. They can happen, but um, not sure what that fear was based on, but hey, I was a kid. Sometimes that happens. So um, to uh, make sure that we were safe, I would turn on the Weather Channel and keep it on for hours. I would sit there and watch it for hours. I just liked seeing um, the meteorologists talk about how they put their forecast together. And then, of course, the reassurance that we were going to be OK <laughs> also helped. But um, the more I watched the Weather Channel, the more I realized that this was really fascinating. There's a lot going on behind the scenes. Um, it felt like a puzzle, how the meteorologists would use different information about different layers in the atmosphere, different variables, the moisture, the temperature, how the winds were moving um, to put together their forecasts. Um, so really from the age of you know nine or 10, I was interested in, in being a meteorologist. I wanted to study the weather and put together forecasts. 
So all through middle and high school, that remained my interest. And um, I went to college to study atmospheric science. Um, and in college, I learned several things. One Where'd that you go to school? I went to Cornell University up in upstate New York. They have a nice small atmospheric science program that appealed to me. I got to know all my professors. My professors knew me, at least in the atmospheric science department. Um, and I got to know all my classmates. Again, nice, a, small, a nice small department, felt more like a family. And um, I learned mainly from my classmates who were much more weather nerds. And I say that with the highest respect <laughs> um, because I learned so much about forecasting from them. Um, but uh, they were much more weather nerds than I was. And I was realizing I like weather forecasting, but I'm not sure I like it enough to do it every day, day in, day out. Um, so I began to look for opportunities to learn about other things that would interest me enough to pursue it as a career. Um, so I did summer internships, um, worked with professors on different things and realized that one, I was interested in research I liked and was intrigued by the idea that the professors didn't always have the answer. They were doing research too. Um, and so we were kind of solving problems together, was learning how to pose research questions and figure out how to answer them. And that intrigued me. The other thing I learned that um, I was interested in, and I thought this was magical, that you can use um, remote sensing. So remote sensing is just a way of learning about something or sensing something without touching it. So you're doing it remotely. Right. So, um, you know, all of us on the call in one way or another, whether it's through um, closed captioning, maybe you're, you're reading um, what we're saying, you're listening to what we're saying, maybe you're watching us. Um, you're, we're all using some remote sensing tools in our eyes and ears, right? Um, well, there are instruments that we design every day that um, also remotely sense our environment. Um, and we can design Which is them. Which amazing science, by the way. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I thought it was magical. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> of course, I ended up learning the science. So it's not, it's not quite so magical, but I still think it's incredible how much yeah. we can learn. <laughs> well, it's with um, the technology, and the technology is you've grown with the technology. So you've seen it improve and improve. But mm -hmm. go ahead. Yeah. So um, that was something else that I learned through internships that I, I sought out in college that I was interested in remote sensing. And um, specifically, I ended up realizing, um, well, I kind of learned this in grad school, I think. So I decided to go to graduate school after college to continue learning how to do research, to learn more about remote sensing and how we could use um, the radiation that Earth either reflects from the sun or emits based on you know, its temperature and other properties um, to learn about Earth. And uh, I ended up studying more reflective sunlight um, based on the really the advisor that took me into his research group. Um, and uh, I did that at the University of Colorado at Boulder. That's where I got my PhD in atmospheric science. Um, and that, you know, PhD is really learning how to do research. It's learning how to pose your own research questions and pursue them and answer them. While I was in graduate school um, in beautiful Boulder, Colorado, I um, I was able to participate under the guidance of my research advisor um, on a project. Um, so it was Clario, really the predecessor to Clario Pathfinder. But I got to work on Clario um, as, uh, a as a graduate student. student. Yes. Oh, I had wow. my own little so project. Before you joined NASA. Exactly, exactly. It was wow. my research advisor who had written a grant um, proposal and, and gotten funding. And that funding really supported my PhD education. And um, through working on that project and, uh, and supporting this mission, I got to meet some of my colleagues who I still work with at NASA today. Um, and it, it was really through that experience that I got to, well, let them know, I guess, just from you know, doing my best and doing good work um, that I could be a valuable asset to their team. Um, so they saw that in me and decided, hey, you know, once a position opens up, we're gonna let her know about it. And thankfully I ended up getting that position. Um, and that's the position I hold at NASA Langley in, in Virginia today. Okay, so as, as I'm old school, so I'm gonna say, hey, break it down for, for our viewers that, that aren't that familiar with the, the science of what you do. Tell us in lay terms, what exactly you do in terms of this instrument that, that orbits the Earth um, that I understand from the research I did is also going to be 
uh, tied in or part of uh, the International Space Station. Can you tell us a little bit more about it, uh, again, in lay terms, what, what you guys are trying to, to learn? Absolutely. So um, the Clario Pathfinder mission, um, which is a bit smaller, um, has a smaller scope than the full Clario mission did. That one didn't actually end up flying. We did quite a bit of science to lay the groundwork for Clario Pathfinder. Um, but it will be, so it's not up there yet. Um, it'll be launching hopefully in a couple years, um, but it will be an instrument mounted on this International Space Station that will be looking at Earth and taking measurements of reflected sunlight um, in a number of different frequencies between the visible, so the visible is the part of the spectrum where we, our eyes are sensitive, and then also some slightly longer wavelengths where we can't see information um, with our eyes, but we can still learn about clouds, about water vapor, about the surface from that reflected sunlight. All the things um, that we're concerned about as a society. Exactly, exactly. These are all things about Earth that it's important for us to have an understanding of. Um, so that instrument will be um, unique in that it will be much more accurate than the instruments that we currently have observing Earth. And this is important for observing climate. So I wanna talk for just a second about the difference between weather and climate. So weather, we all experience this, right? It's the day to day, sometimes it's warm, sometimes it's cool. A couple of days ago here in, um, in Virginia, it was in the mid seventies and it was gorgeous. Today, I think the high is in the fifties. So it's a little cooler and it's kind of rainy. <laughs> so that's weather, you get those kinds yeah. of fluctuations. Please explain that. <laughs> well, that would take a much longer time. <laughs> no, go but ahead. <laughs> what I'll say is, you know, if, if someone were to ask me what it's like here in Virginia in the summer, I would say it's hot and sticky. It is hot and humid. That is the climate of Virginia. You know, that's a way of describing the climate in Virginia in the summer. But in the day to day in the summertime, sometimes it could be warmer, sometimes it could be cooler, sometimes it could be moist, sometimes it could be dry. Um, that's the weather. With climate change, wow. we could be getting, um, or we are seeing that, um, for example, summers in Virginia could be getting warmer over time. So on average, you know, someone 50 years from now may say it's hot and sticky, but it's hotter and stickier than it was 50 years ago, as an example. Um, so to make sure we see those small but long term changes in climate, we need to make sure we have high accurate and stable measurements that are kind of tied to solid standards um, uh, so that we can discern those changes separate from any fluctuation, you know, instruments can be, they can be kind of finicky, right? And they're not perfect. Mm. Um, uh, how accurate they are can kind of drift. Um, and so we want to be able to distinguish what fluctuations we're seeing in our instrument and so how well it's taking measurements. Data. Mm. Exactly. And separate that out from what's happening physically in Earth's climate. So that's yeah. where the high accuracy tied to solid kind of anchored international standards comes from. And that's something that Clario Pathfinder will provide. So one of the things that fascinates me about what you do and what you're involved in, and, and I like to point this out, is that there are a lot of partners and, uh, you know, different organizations and companies, different parts of NASA, et cetera, that all come together to make this happen. Somebody has to put that Pathfinder in orbit. Somebody has to monitor it while it's in orbit. Um, and you know, there's your deep space network that's probably part of providing information for the data that you receive and the, the commands that you give to that spacecraft, et cetera, and so forth. But I, 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 was, I, I looked on a page and it, it showed probably, um, I don't know, 20 or 30 different agencies and companies and everything that's involved with this one uh, project that you guys are doing. Oh yeah, so every satellite mission um, that both NASA and, and, um, and NOAA who focus more on like weather satellite, oops, I'm sorry, my uh, screensaver came on, um, but- We didn't see uh, it. Oh good, um, <laughs> so I couldn't see you guys. It's probably but, something climate related. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, we, we work on these satellite instruments. We work on them very hard here on the ground and then we put them up in space and we can't touch them anymore, right? 
So there's all this work that needs to go into um, the, the quality of those instruments and making sure we understand them very well um, before they get launched into space. There's other things we can do to, to understand them after they're in space, but we have a lot less control over um, what we can uh, wrap our heads around once they're up there. And that takes a lot of expertise, takes a lot of partners. On Clario Pathfinder, it's us at NASA Langley, and then our partners, actually, I'm still working with my research advisor um, and, and, and his uh, group over at uh, the University of Colorado. Um, they're actually building the Clario Pathfinder payload, um, so the instrument and the pointing system and everything that will go um, onto the, the space station. Um, and they work with a whole suite of companies that are providing them with the different components that will make up the payload. Exactly. So those are yeah. all those organizations. Mm -hmm. There are some here in the US, there are some in Europe. I mean, they, you know, this really needs to be a collaborative, um, you know, uh, situation where we all put our heads together. We all bring different corners of expertise to this problem of, of building a lasting um, uh, satellite instrument. Um, that can provide us with the kind of information that we need. Well, and wow. so like with Rafael, uh, see, I was going to try to roll my R, don't leave it alone, Vince. <laughs> Rafael Way, <laughs> um, I, uh, I could listen to you for an entire show too. Both of you have just really, really amazing backgrounds with what you do. You know, one of the main goals with this program is to uh, enlighten uh, the, the up and coming and let them know about the opportunities that are out there, uh, as well as inspire them to let them see what you, uh, representation, what you guys are doing, um, and, and hopefully also opening their eyes to let them know that there are a lot of things in addition to being a pilot, an astronaut, an engineer, et cetera, uh, that are, that are possibilities. As, as you do what you do, um, for climate science and that type of thing at NASA, what are your thoughts about um, the next generation coming in and how, how to get them uh, more engaged or let them know of the, of what's available out there? So, um, you know, something that Ruth Bilway said about her experience that um, she didn't see anyone doing, you know, being pilots, any women, you know, or black women being pilots, anyone who looked like her doing what she was interested in doing. And I can certainly still say that for myself, it's, it's I, I get excited still just seeing um, people of color, especially women of color um, who are in leadership positions um, and you know who are leading missions or leading organizations at NASA, um, because that helps me think like, I could do this someday. I can only imagine um, what that looks like for a student um, who may look like me, um, who may be seeing me talk about what I do. Um, and I hope that's inspiring to them. This is um, something that's important to me. I do this um, as, a, as a part of my job and trying to you know, virtually talk to um, students in classrooms and different um, after school programs and things like that, just to let them see, yeah, there's this representation in the field. And even if we're not dominating the field yet, we're here and we're, and we're doing great stuff. And that means um, that you can do, you know, if I can do it, you definitely can. Full so, disclosure. Um, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. No, that's it. Go ahead. I was just going to say full disclosure. So my first time finding out about you and, and what you do and everything was when they did the dedication for the, the NASA headquarters renaming uh, at the Dorothy Johnson uh, NASA headquarters. And you actually were Mary Jackson, Mary Jackson, Mary Jackson. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm mixing up the hidden figures. Thank you for correcting me. <laughs> I, I, uh, but yeah, Mary Jackson headquarters and, and you were one of the uh, speakers for that, uh, which the thing I looked at is I said, she's a what? <laughs> so, so that, that got my attention, but it was really great to see uh, that there was a woman of color in that aspect of, of the industry uh, and that type of thing. I'm going to switch back over to you, Rafil Way, um, as you patiently uh, listened uh, to a great background from, from Dr. Shea. But, you know, you have a perspective that also is, is very interesting and very enlightening in terms of being from South Africa uh, and, and being in an in a, a area that you have a lot of opportunity to expose people to the opportunities in, in aviation uh, and aerospace. So 
when you uh, tell us about your transition from being a helicopter pilot for the South African police to wanting to move forward with your foundation and, and the things that you're currently doing. I think they, I mean, um, Yolanda as well has said it, I think, a few times as well, that you can't be what you, you know, what you can't see. And, and earlier on as well, I said that I couldn't imagine myself being any of the things that I'm doing now because I, I, I didn't see people that looked like me. So I think that was one of the, the, the first biggest things. So it, it actually started during um, when I was still a helicopter pilot that there's not a lot of us, you know, now that I've reached this stage, but I don't see, I still don't see, you know, other people that, you know, that look like me. And I mean, there, there were as well, you know, few challenges within, you know, within the environment. I remember as well when, because they were not quite ready for us, we didn't have the uniform that actually fits us. So we had to wear null uniform and I'm, and I'm quite small. So you can imagine how big those overalls, flight suits were. So it, it so, and then you, it, it was quite interesting, yeah. So, so- You have those, an, wait, tell that story because that's an interesting story. A, a fellow <laughs> pilot of yours here in the States told me about you and, and what you had to do <laughs> to find something to fit you. Oh, no, no, what, 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 <laughs> what is the story? <laughs> well, that you that you actually found something here, right? On one of your visits. Yeah, yes, one of yeah. the one of the visits. So I was so it was quite interesting that She's like, I what did had they say? To, what did they say? Yeah. <laughs> no, no, because I, I, I was actually coming back to, to you know to the story that at some point I was like, I need to interact with other women. I need to find out you know, where do you get your uniform? What do you do? Women that have flown helicopters. Because it was quite interesting when I, when I was doing um, training with the helicopter, I was, I was like, I, I used to weigh like 40 something kg and the, the solo requirement for helicopters are about 60, 65. So I had to fly with extra weights when I flew solo in the, in the helicopters. So those, so I used to walk around with like a, you know, a bag or a, a concrete. So I wanted something much more sexy, if you can put it, that I can walk around, you know, like <laughs> carry on and put it in my helicopter when I was flying solo. So I was like, I need to find other women. I need to speak to them. I need, I need to find out look more what more piloting. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> so I needed, and, there were not a lot of us. And I, I was like, so I was doing research. I, I, I found another women from Kenya who were interacting. And it was quite interesting that in that time, there was a conference that was taking place in Atlanta in the US, Women in Aviation Conference. I'm like, no, I have to go to this conference in way back in 2009. And so I got my visa and I didn't know anybody. I just only, only knew this lady, um, Kajuji from Kenya. And well, by just chatting on email, but we haven't actually met. And I flew to Atlanta to find other women. And I remember walking into that hall the first day and it was just a wave of women. Women in the Navy, women from, I mean, from all over. And I was like, what? So there's- a great you know, organization. There's, there's, a yeah, great there organization. is a lot of women for Women in Aviation International. And I think that's when it, you know, and, and this was quite actually, you know, important as well, because all along, even though I was in the industry for quite a while before I came, I went to the, um, to the conference, I felt like a visitor. And it wasn't because of the people around me. I mean, I had a great boss, the people that I worked with, you know, you know they were great. But somehow I still felt that like I was a visitor in the, you know, in the industry, like I didn't quite belong. And it was in that conference and I'm like, yo, I'm home. You know, there's all these people, they're wearing captain ranks, they're wearing, you know, and I've never, it, you know, from, from, you know, the few women that I've seen in, in South Africa, I, I had a, you know, my only view was only those few women that I've seen in South Africa. And then there's a whole lot of thousands of women. And I think it was in that moment that I felt at home in the industry that, you know what, I am part of, you know, I'm part of the, in, you know, in the industry. But what came about as well from that conference is the realization of the importance of going back and showing South Africa the same thing that I had seen. Because it was at that conference that I, I you know, finally it was like, no, it was okay. It was eye-opening. It was eye-opening. Eye and you know who I met at that conference? The first women that flew for um, the first black crew, it was Captain Rochelle and the first officer uh, for in the US. They yes. were at that conference. And I think it happened at that particular, like in 2009, around that particular time. And now I'm meeting 
that kept him there and i'm like oh okay i you, i saw you on tv you know great to meet you <laughs> so kind of thing so it was it was a very impactful conference very profound it yeah. has it it impacted my life but most importantly most of the decision you know coming from that conference and the people that i have met paved a way for what we have today the foundation that i'm running girls fly program in africa foundation because i came back home and i'm like we need to have something similar to what i've seen in the us so they can we can all gather whether there's 10 of us or 15 of us so these youngsters can see there's there's 15 so they yes. are there and we can have a platform where we can engage and we can you know in a way belong you know in into that platform because there were such there's certain issues that are you know no offense to you vince but they, they're just for us you know women we need to sit there and we need no, to engage no, on that no no i don't level. take offense at all you, you know yeah <laughs> yeah you know same tell us about as, your yeah. foundation tell us about your foundation so <laughs> they it, it was uh, established to address challenges faced by you know by young students particularly in the uh, in the stem field but you know with a focus on you know on aviation aviation and space so one of the biggest thing growing up is i didn't have enough information i didn't know i could become a pilot so my foundation is solving that by being visible by being accessible for those youngsters that they too know that they could become pilot number two provide them information if you want to become a pilot, if you want to become an engineer or any career in the STEM field, what is then the process? Where do you get that information? So we want to provide that information. The third thing, scholarships, money. You know, most of the students that we impact, especially in South Africa and Africa, their story resonates with my story. They, some of them are born in very poor background, poor families. And with that, they stand no chance because to train as a commercial pilot in South Africa, it will set you about half a million rand. So if you're, for example, from a family of seven and a single paycheck, there's no way that you're going to afford that half a million. So we, we, we work with a different organization, different companies to be able to provide them with scholarship or even guide them where do you get the scholarship or even tell our stories. What is it that we did? You know, writing 200 letters, it might inspire somebody and say, you know what, I'll write 200 letters as well if I had to be faced with a similar, with a similar challenge. Exactly. So, it, so that, that is why we exist. We want to impact life one girl at a time through education through mentorship through scholarships and networking the other thing is networks at that conference there you go. yeah i was going to actually importance i was going to actually networks. talk to yes. both of you about that so speak on <laughs> yeah it's 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 you know it, those are very very important because that's how you get the next lead the next job the next opportunities it happens through those networks. So well, you were, you were you were an exact example of that when you went came to the states and went to the Women in Aviation conference. That was a big networking thing for you because it introduced it, you to people yeah. that you would otherwise not have met. It was a huge network, and guess what? The following year, we had a conference in South Africa, and guess who were at that conference? That network that I made uh, that I met in the U.S. Nice. I had I had uh, women from the U.S. Navy flying to South Africa for the conference. I had the networks flying to South Africa for the, con for the conference, but finally I had people that I can go back to. And when, I, when there's a challenge and I'm like, you know, guys, I've got this challenge. How did you, you know, you know how did you um, overcome the challenge? But even most importantly, during my career, my progression in, you know, in the career, there was a point when I, I needed help with a scholarship. It was my networks, going back to those networks, uh, applying for the 99 scholarships that enabled me to do my uh, King Air rating, applying for women in corporate scholarship that enabled me to do my instructor's rating. Now creating those networks in South Africa, creating those platforms as well, for those youngsters to be able to access those opportunities that I was able to access through those networks that I made in that first conference, it was very, very important. And you know, just before I can, like, you know, I'm not going to even mention the mission, but just in simple terms, that is why we exist, that we, can, that we can have more of me and more of other those pilots in South Africa and in Africa as a whole. Well, there you go. That, that, that says it all. But it gives me a good segue back to uh, Yolanda. Yolanda, in your world of, of science and climate science, uh, in terms of inspiring youth to get into this particular aspect of things what kind of things do you recommend what what what's their their next steps to to get involved in in that uh and, and what do they need from an education standpoint etc yeah um 
math and science. That's always my first answer to, to this question. Um, it can open so many doors. You hear it in her field by story. You know, she had a science degree and, you know, her potential employers already liked that. They're like, oh, we don't have to worry about this. You already have this. Um, this understanding, this this education, um, it provides you with a good foundation for you to ask whatever questions you may want to ask. You could dabble in one thing and then get, kind of dabble in another thing if you want to. Um, but it, it really does open doors if this is the kind of thing that's interesting to you. I think I think the persistence and the um, you know the perseverance that we especially hear in Reveal My Story. Um, is important too. It's okay for this not to be easy. You know, if you struggle, if something is hard, it doesn't mean that you're not good at it. It doesn't mean that it's not possible for you. It just means that you may need a different approach. You may need some additional help. Um, you know, just just hearing um, the all the information Ruth Lowe talked about in terms of, you know, seeking out community, seeking out a network, um, you know, find, kind of find your um, your support network, whoever that, that looks like. If it's a group of friends who, who really truly believe that you are awesome and are, you know, willing to tell you that all the time, that can, that can do a lot, you know, for, especially for those moments when it's harder and you're just not seeing it in yourself. Um, and it doesn't just have to be people who look like you. I, I think I've had, I've had mentors, um, you know, one of, one of the people who were responsible, one of the people who was responsible for my getting my job at NASA, um, you know, recently retired and, Oh man, I swear he always saw the potential for me to to lead this team, to be a leader on this project, and I didn't see it every day. <laughs> and it was helpful to to know that um, someone who had such a big influence in climate science had that um, had that confidence in me. Um, my research advisor, and of course my family and friends. Um, I have a, a core group of of women um, who we were all in graduate school together. So we all got degrees in atmosphere, PhDs in atmospheric science, and we're still on you know text change, and we still encourage each other um, even nice. in our, our jobs now. That and, and that's a big so part important. of it too. Your colleagues and and that type of thing. You know, so Rafilway and 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 Yolanda, you guys are one of many who have and many that I've had on the show, and and both of you have talked about it. Uh, today in terms of your backgrounds who have taken paths that you didn't even realize you were going to take. And I, I think that's a, a, a big takeaway that, that you can start out with one goal uh, and you may have a bigger goal, uh, a long-term goal, but to get to that other end, you may go through a lot of different iterations and changes and challenges, et cetera, and so forth. Um, but in terms of persistence, Sticking with uh, your 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 main goal, um, you know, will will help you get there, even if you have to zigzag on the way. And it's okay for that goal to change. You know, I mean, I started off thinking goal, yes. I was going to be yeah. a meteorologist, and that is not that that's okay that it wasn't in the cards for me, or that wasn't the right path for me. But I worked hard to figure out what did kind of speak to me and where I could make my mark. And also, I think um, it's helpful to tell students that. It's okay if you don't know exactly what you want. If you just have something that interests you, go pursue it. You know, go go play in that for a little bit, and it may open doors for you. That and also figure out what doors you should close and say, I, you know, like Rafael was saying, like I'm not going to be a doctor. I'm going to go over here, and then that opened doors that she probably didn't imagine even the first day that she realized that she wanted to go into aviation. Rafael, I don't know if you want to talk more about that, but no, I was actually what I was going to say is that one of the biggest joys I've had is seeing. Uh, somebody that was inspired by what I do in the industry and watching them climb and grow and do their, have, have you guys experienced that where you've had a, a student or, or somebody that you've known that got inspired by what you were doing and therefore now they're doing something great too? Either one of you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think with the girls fly program in Africa, you know, um, just going back when you when you when you've got a volunteer based organization as well you need an inspiration to keep going and we continuously get messages of oh thank you this is where i am or oh, i just graduated in an aeronautical engineering degree or oh, i went solo you know for you know for my flying so it it, it is quite like i, I mean I, we we get that every day and it keeps us going because the, when you hear those positive stories, how your story has impacted somebody else or how somebody started because, you know, of hearing what you've done, it just, you just keep going. And I mean, we've been at it for the past 10 years in different forms. 
and you know we we personally we the 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 gains that we get is those stories the the, the feedback that that we're getting but i just wanted to add add what yolanda has said earlier on the the importance of being open minded enough to pivot as well because sometimes yes. you know you get you know you 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 get challenges and sometimes opportunities they mask themselves as challenges as well where <laughs> if you're not open minded enough and say okay let me try this maybe let me go this path you will never know of, like of, you of, did as a helicopter yeah, pilot as a, as a helicopter and you know as and 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 in it, and as well saying you know you've got yes i had a plan you want to become a doctor but but maybe not you know having that flexibility or i wanted to become a meteorologist maybe not maybe having that open minded enough and and flexibility enough and say let me try something else you know it, it, there's still that plan that's in place but perhaps that's something else that is your you know that is your, your your path so i think just to add on what you you said earlier that that for me it's quite important that um when a challenge come embrace it i know sometimes it's it's you know for the youngsters it's difficult and i cannot show them every success that i've had it was masked as a challenge sure yolanda how about you what's your perspective on that in terms of what you've seen I, I love that, um, that every opportunity you've had has been masked as a challenge, because I certainly have had things that have terrified me <laughs> that <laughs> I have tried or done, and um, whether they end up being successful or not, I learned something from them. And I think having that, that growth mindset of, I'm going to try this thing and see how it goes, and okay, if it's not a screaming success, that's okay. Um, but what do I learn from that? What do I take with me to the next opportunity or challenge that I pursue? Um, and I agree, Rip Philway, that like it's encouraging to hear from students like, hey, you inspired me or hey, this experience that we had together was um, was so exciting. I wanted to I want to continue working in this um, or I want to go off and, and pursue something different. But like still that their interaction with you or your story or something inspired them or that they took your advice and that it's working well for them. That's um, it certainly, you know, adds to the excitement of, of wanting to do um, even opportunities like this of, you know, um, this, you know, who knows what we've said in this one hour that could inspire someone or oh, absolutely. That could help encourage someone, you know, so, yeah. Absolutely. That's why I do the show every week. <laughs> I love that. Inspire. You were going to say something earlier, Yolanda, uh, Yolanda I'm sorry, about um, regarding aviation or aerospace. Uh, yeah. Were, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, um, you know, you had mentioned this about um, NASA when we were talking before the show that NASA is often thought of as an, um, you know, an organization that studies planetary bodies and oh, other planets because Earth is a planet. So we do study planetary bodies. Um, but then also, um, you know, NASA does aviation at NASA Langley that, you know, NASA Langley is over 100 years old and it has its roots in, in, um, in aerospace and aeronautics research. Um, so, you know, there, if, if someone's interested in, in working at an organization like NASA, um, you know, there's so many different things you can do. Even if you're not interested in a STEM field um, specifically, we have people who are, um, um, who are experienced in science writing or the journalism side to help us tell our story. Sometimes our, we scientists and engineers need help with that. Um, we have folks who help manage our finances. Um, we have lawyers. I mean, there are different ways you could support, um, you know, different that's technical true. missions if you're just excited about the story that we have to tell. No, that's, that's a great thing that you bring up. Try to tell people that all the time. You can have an area of specialization that you may not think is applicable to aviation or aerospace. And in fact, it very much is. Um, mm -hmm. I remember somebody recently finding out that's interested in being an attorney and found out that they're aviation lawyers. You know, so there's aviation yeah. law and they were like, oh, really? There's aviation law. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody's got to take care of those things, too. So I had a funny one. It was um, the professor um, Pablo de Leon at, at UND, University of North Dakota. And I'll never forget the comedy made while he was doing the show with us. And he said, yeah, well, you know, when we go to Mars, we're going to need a few things like somebody's going to have, have to have a, a dental background in case any of us have, have problems with our teeth and things like that. And I was like, you know, you got a point there, guy. <laughs> so absolutely. Listen, we only have about five minutes left, and I wanted to make sure that I give you both an opportunity 
to talk a little bit about what you see in the future uh, as because we are in a robust industry, um, both aviation and aerospace. I mean, there's the infamous pilot shortage, which kind of came to a stop in 2020, but got news for everybody. It's going to be back um, uh, with a vengeance. And there's going to be a lot of opportunity uh, to be a pilot, to be, uh, you know, in all the other areas of it, a mechanic, et cetera, and so forth. And of course, we can all see what's going on in aerospace with uh, the landing of Perseverance on Mars and the Ingenuity helicopter that's supposed to fly next week. First time on a, 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 a something built here on Earth, flying on another planet or another planet's atmosphere and all that kind of stuff. So and not to mention the Artemis program that's gonna to go to the moon and to Mars. So there's just tons of things going on. I'll start with you, Rafilway. What, what do you see with what you're doing and what you would like to see happen with young girls there in South Africa and in Africa as a whole? And quite frankly, you have an international influence. So but what would you like to see and what do you see in the yeah. future? Yeah, it's... Um... You know, when we look at STEM education as a whole, statistics, 75% um, of the future jobs are going to require STEM. You mentioned the fact that, yes, there is a downturn in the aviation industry, but we know we've, we've faced downturns in, uh, previously, but we've always managed to come up again. So the demand for pilots is going to increase. Less than 5% of airline pilots still are women. So women pilots are still going to be in demand. But uh, I think most importantly as well, we're going to start seeing some of the other technologies, like, for example, drone, drone technology, um, you know, picking up. And especially in, uh, in our um, continent, Africa, where, you know, where we still have issues of infrastructure, we still have issues of transporting certain things. So I see that technology picking up, um, you know, quite a lot to actually solve some of the socioeconomic um, challenges that we're facing as a continent. So in terms of where the foundation is going, we're going to keep at it. We're going to keep um, encouraging girls to enter the careers in the STEM field because that's where everything is going. If 75% of the jobs are going to be in the STEM field, we better be on the forefront. Majority of that 75%, it better be us. So we're preparing them. <laughs> yeah, we're preparing them. But I mean, from even an economic perspective, you know, to solve some of the socioeconomic issues in the continent as well, you know, to make sure that the majority of uh, that population is educated in the in the technical field. So sure. I see the te uh, drone technology um, picking okay. up and yeah. Yeah, no, I was going to go ahead because I was going to ask you to mention we're, we only have a few minutes, but uh, yeah. go ahead and say what you're going to say about drones. Drones technology. So I, I'm currently involved in, you know, besides the uh, manned aviation, I'm currently involved in the unmanned aviation industry as well in the training side where we have specialized courses in the drone industry. So you, 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 we don't only teach about the technology, but we teach about the application in some of the pertinent um, industry in Africa. You, we look at food shortage, which is directly, um, um, directly, um, um, linked to agriculture so how do we you know start increasing the production how do you use so, that so yeah how do you use that technology to do that because whether we like it or not as africa we have to leapfrog we can't be saying let's solve this and whatever if we had to start using that technology we need to start using that technology today so i'm, I'm involved in that it's quite exciting and we're getting as many women in the industry in that industry as possible involved in the agriculture because not only does it give them the skill to be able to apply that technology now as people that are in that agriculture field, they're suddenly increasing their production. They're using that technology. So we're changing the landscape. We're changing the, you know, you know, the, 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 the field. So for us, I think for me, it's, it's one of the exciting things that, um, yeah, I'm, kind of, I'm currently involved in. Wonderful. And Yolanda, our climate is evolving on an ongoing basis and in a very significant way. So what do you see for the future with regard to what you do and what the uh, upcoming generation can get involved in? What I've been inspired by, by the, um, by the younger generations, um, you know, teenagers and in, in the 20 somethings that they, they see the impact that climate change is having on our earth, on our home and um, our 
not standing for it. You know, they're they're throwing out lawsuits and they're thinking of ways that they we can better take care of Earth. Um, we're going to need solutions like that. We're going to need that kind of radical thinking. I'm excited that they are they are thinking about that and they are working toward that. Um, you know, once once they're ready to vote and once they're ready to you know get into the workforce, they can only imagine what they're going to do. Um, but you know, this is a problem that's going to stick with us. We have seven plus billion people on this earth, and we continue to to live here. And uh, we're going to need some creative problem solving to help us figure out how we can best take care of our earth as we do that. Um, and then we're also going to need more scientists to understand how our behavior is impacting the climate. You know, this is a nonpartisan issue. This is something that we all need to rally around as a global community um, to best understand. So. Um, you know, the more diverse thought that we can get involved in the field, the better. Ladies, I could have had a show for each of you, one hour each, <laughs> about all the things that you have to say about what you do, who you are, and, and where you've come from in terms of your careers. It has been an honor and a pleasure having both of you on this show and talking about uh, very enlightening and valuable information for our viewers uh, for the young ones, for some of the parents watching, and for some in the industry who I know are watching too. So uh, thank you again, Dr. Yolanda Shea at NASA, uh, Langley Research Center. Appreciate you being with us. Uh, thank you also, so much. Also, Way. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> you roll the tongue nicely now. <laughs> that was beautiful. I, help. I, had, I had to give it a go <laughs> at least one time. No, seriously, all the way from Johannesburg, uh, which right now, uh, I believe it is 6 p.m. there. Uh, yes, or you it, would say it is 8, 6 p.m. 1800. Uh, 1800, so, yes. 1800. <laughs> Thank you so much for being on with us. I, you, you have a, an extremely busy schedule as well. So for both of you to take the time out to, to be on the show is greatly appreciated, ladies. Thank you for having us. And Yolanda, thank, uh, it is a pleasure meeting you. I shall be visiting you in the U.S. at some point. It's a pleasure <laughs> meeting you. If I ever find myself in South Africa, I'll try to look you up. <laughs> awesome. Well, so, ladies, uh, wishing you both the best. Uh, and, and, um, and, and particularly with what you're, you're both doing in your careers and everything. Uh, seriously, hope that, that uh, things continue to move forward as they keep on keeping on. Uh, that's a better way for me to put it. But thank you again. Uh, you, my name is Vince Mickens, and this is uh, All Things Aviation and Aerospace. Uh, I'm with Pro, um, Private Air Media Group. And uh, it's been uh, great to have everybody watching and, and got a lot of questions. Sorry I didn't get all your questions in, but thank you all for watching the program. We'll see you next week with another show. You guys take care. Thank you very much. <laughs>